he wrote the screenplay One Mile North. Stand over here. Um, which is a story about a restaurant near Ground Zero and the recovery workers who frequented it. And he's also associate producer of Praying for Rain, um, a drought farm, a drought farm drama um, that uh, opened in 2017. I, it's there is so much. Let me put it to you this way: when I knew I was going to have to introduce him, I went to Wikipedia. And I was like, okay, let me just take a little, you know what I mean, a little here, a little there. There is no way that I can adequately introduce him except to say, if you live in Miami and you make films, you need to know Tom Muska. So without further ado, Tom Muska. Hello, hello. <laughs> you, you, you did okay, Brian, but I, I also wrote Stay and Live. I did Tortilla Soup. I did Money for Nothing. There's a bunch of films. It's okay. Um, I'm, I, I, what am I? I'm a Hollywood hyphenate. What does that mean? I'm a screenwriter by choice, a producer by necessity, and a director by self-defense. I started as one thing, and I evolved to all three. Uh, I used to make, like Brian was saying, Hollywood-type films. I did one with James Gandolfini, John Cusack, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Benicio Del Toro. It was great for a while. And then I came out here to teach. And I now make a different type of film. I make Miami films. In fact, I'm starting to shoot next Friday. Um, yeah, first COVID, uh, post-COVID film. Um, so I'm, I'm making a lower budget film, but fortunately of the, of the uh, last three films I've made, we sold them all to HBO. I have one running there now called Chateau of Vato, V-A-T-O. It's a comedy starring Paul Rodriguez. I, I, if you're interested in my talk, you might want to not read my novel. By the way, Taco Jesus sounds like a comedy to me. He said he didn't write comedy. That's a comedy if I ever heard one. But he gave a very nice talk. I want to I piggyback on something he said, though. He said the Sopranos changed television, and it did. But it's not only content that changes television or film. It's the actual mechanics of making a film. Television changed with the DVR. Before that, there were all single character, single episodes. Characters didn't change, like he was saying. But now, once you had the DVR, you don't have to be present to watch the show. Today, of course, we have binging, streaming, so it's not an issue anymore. But that's what changed television. You could now watch 10 episodes in one day. And so you didn't have to have standalone episodes that had a beginning, middle, and end. You now could follow a storyline left to right over time. That's what changed television. And that has to do with the manufacturing of movies. Everything has changed since I, when I was first, I went to UCLA Film School. I, I mean, it's just so different. I spent, uh, I did a feature film, I spent $22,000 doing my credits. Can you imagine today? That's a budget of a, of a short film now. You know, it's just different. It's always evolving. And, and that's why these kind of conferences are good because you, in fact, have to keep up with what's going on. Whether you're just a writer or a producer, a director, an actor, the more you know, the better off you are. Um, let's, let's, I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes, and this is by a screenwriter who actually died this year. But I just, I love starting with this quote because it really defines who the screenwriter is and what we do and how we think. The scriptwriter has the right and probably the duty to be an out-and-out -out criminal in his thoughts. He should several times a day kill his father, rape his mother, and sell his sister and his country. He must search for the criminal within himself. He must make an effort to be shameless. But if there is a bastard within him, there is also a Puritan. He himself is a multiple personality. You are always walking around. It's, it's almost like having a child. I remember when I had my first child, I was following it one day around the block. And, oh, there's a car coming, or there's a tree that might, looks like it might tilt over because the lightning hit it, and there's a homeless person, and there's this, and there's that, and there's this, and I'm running what? 
Worst case scenarios in my head, 10 a minute as most mothers do. You're constantly running worst case scenarios, worst case scenario. So after an hour with a three-year-old, you come back home and mom sits down like this because she just ran 300 worst case scenarios in her head. None of them occurred. But that's what you do when you're a screenwriter. You're always pushing towards the limit, pushing towards the limit. What could happen here? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then you start connecting them. So once you train your mind to do that, you'd be surprised how unhappy you will be the rest of your life. That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, you'll, you'll infinitely be able to entertain yourself in any situation, I'll say that. All right, James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers said, the act of writing is finding out what you don't want to know and what you don't want to find out. Whatever you guys come up with is gonna be different than what you think you're doing when you begin it. It is a process. Writing is a process. I have written screenplays in as little, you know, for money for two and a half months, and I've written an adaptation that took me a year and a half. You would think the book would take a very short amount of time, and the original screenplay would take less, not necessarily. This is one of my favorite moments. William Faulkner went through a number of marriages, and one time he was doing what this w woman was doing. He was looking out the window like this, and she said, William, don't you think you should get to work? And he turned and I said, I am working. We get paid to daydream. I, I never feel like I have a beginning, a middle, and end to my day. I really don't. I am constantly thinking, working. My projects, I, I, if I don't get a, 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 a line, I rewrite my script so many times my actors hate me. They literally get angry at me because, oh, here's a new draft, here's a new draft, here's a new draft. I work them, I work them. Of course, I've been in enough editing rooms, which is where I really learned how to write, that I know how much rewriting is done in the editing room. And it has nothing to do with creating new work. It's, it's creating pictures that now tell the story and rearranging them and modifying them to make the story work. When you look at an assembly edit of your first cut, it's like watching a person who's, I don't know what the proper politically uh, correct term is, but let's just say someone who has some muscular issues dancing. It, it, your first assembly edit is all over the place because it has no rhythm or tone. And you start working it in the editing room. But in the script, you can, you can only approximate what that is. Let's talk about uh, writing. Everything you see on screen is first written. It begins with the word. As much as I'm a director, as much as I'm a producer, I always call myself a screenwriter first. That's the definition of who I am as a, as a human being. I am a screenwriter. I'm also a film teacher, but that's something else. Writing. Writing is like driving a car at night. You can only see as far as your headlights, but it's possible to do that. You can get through the whole way. Now, when you write a screenplay, sometimes you write right to left and left to right once you're through it once. How do I write? One of the things I, I work with my students and, and, and anyone else who asks me is, you've all grown up using prose, right? Prose being sentences to describe things. They are invaluable in the screenwriting process. Young screenwriters make the mistake of writing the script way too early because it is one of the most awkward forms when you get into screenwriting and it really hypnotizes you in a way that you'll never understand. When you start doing exterior, forest, day, blah, 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 it's very hard once you've created these scenes to really play with them once the whole thing lays out. But that's not true with prose. Prose you can play with endlessly, can't you? Those of you who have written, I've written novels, but prose you can play with endlessly. So I really, really suggest you spend more time writing your story and your character out in a synopsis. In fact, that's also how you fix your screenplay, but I'll get to that in a second. So you have a concept for a web series or a single movie, whatever it be, and use the power of sentences to talk about what, you know, it's almost like writing a, a trailer to your movie. And when I write, when I start beginning with a new idea, I feel like the idea is auditioning 
for a screenplay. I don't think it is a screenplay. I don't grant it that kind of attention yet. It's almost like a first date. You know, I'm going out, I'm feeling it out. You're, you've been on this first date. It's feeling good. Let's have another date. I don't start the screenplay. I don't start the movie yet. It's this, I'm waiting for the idea to convince me that I should spend six months to a year of my life on this. It hasn't done that yet. It's a premise to begin with, right? A log line to begin with, right? It's not a story. What is a story? What is a story? Who knows what a story is? You, you live with stories all around you, yet you know how few people can tell a story? And that, believe it or not, wasn't true of previous generations. And let me just say, I went to a lot of Thanksgivings with my uncles who got drunk and talked about World War II. These guys can spin a story. They weren't screenwriters, but they knew how to tell a story. Most people today, for some reason, really are very awkward in how they tell a story. So, a screenwriter has to be three things I like to talk about. An architect. My son is an architect. What is an architect? That means narrative story structure. Those are the building. Every, every film is made of what? What is the essential building block of a movie, please? What is the essential movie building block of a movie? What? Con conflict is an idea within what I'm talking about. Let's go right there. No, not character. I mean characters. So here we go. What is a scene? The fundamental building block of a screenplay, is it not? When you watch a movie, you are actually watching a collection of scenes. That's what you're watching. In fact, they've moved around since they were first written. They've been condensed since they were first written. They've been changed since they first... In fact, they've been re-emphasized by the director who used the blueprint of the screenplay to decide what the movie could be. So what is it, what's the first obligation of a scene? You can see it up there, correct. I'm gonna... How's <laughs> that? Advance the story. Does the scene advance the story? Number one. Number two, does the scene reveal something new about the character, your protagonist? Number three, does it tell us something about the world and what the young lady said? Does it have conflict? Because if a scene doesn't have conflict, you're not going to use it. Don't write scenes without conflict. So if you have these four things, there's a good chance that scene will hold in the editing room. And don't kid yourself. When you, when you make a feature film, how long is the assembly edit? Assembly edit, you take the script and you put it together. The editor is not getting creative. He's saying, here's the script, here's the film, here it is. I'm putting it together for the, you guys to see what you did first time through. How long are they? How long is a feature film assembly edit in Hollywood? How much has to come back down? They are never too short. They are never too short. You gotta, you gotta take out usually 30%, 25%, 20% of your film and throw it away. And you'll start seeing redundancies, you'll know why. But it's one of the things you have to do. So what I'm saying is, Use the synopsis to begin with, okay? Create your story in terms of a bunch of sentences and, a, and plumb the psychological depths of your character. Let it audition what this screenplay could be, not what it is. Take, writing plot takes time. Writing plot is like going to the dentist chair. It's not that much fun. It's fun to talk about your character. It's fun to talk about the moments, the sizzle the color, it's fun to do all that work. But writing plot, now depending on the genre, isn't that much fun. And no one expects you in initially to write a great plot. You can steal plot, by the way. Plot is stolen all the time, even Mr. Shakespeare did it. But plot isn't fun. Plot is the hard work of writing, and that takes time. So don't expect yourself to figure out your plot in five minutes. We have tools. I think the, the gentleman before me was talking about the three-act structure. The three-act structure is like a circus tent. It allows you to initially create a plot outline that you say, okay, it can fit in the tent. 
my story can fit, I think it can work. And it has two turning points at the end of act one, the end of act two. All right. Now, let's start with a premise or log line. I mentioned that I have a film on HBO, so I might as well promote it because I'm in Hollywood. Or no, I'm not, I'm in Duffy's. I was in Hollywood for most of my life, but now I'm in Duffy's. So here I go. Um, but I think they have really good burger. What, what do I order here, Brian? What, what, what I got here? What do you, what do you, what? The what? Burgers are, you know, if this, if this place can't have good burgers, it can't exist. All right. So here's, here's a, uh, when I sold this film to HBO, they created uh, a log line. This is what they created. A skilled but down on his luck gardener stumbles upon a glorious state that hasn't been landscaped in months. Anything on HBO is going to have a nice short. It's, a, it's, it's, then on our website, I had this one. When an impoverished Latino family squats in a mansion, murder and mistaken identity get twist, twist, twist. We get twisted in a rags to riches comedy of errors. That was, that's on our website. And this is from uh, when it premiered at the Miami Film Festival. A skilled gardener and his family move into an abandoned mansion after discovering the death of its wealthy owner. As the family leaves poverty and hardship behind and starts embracing the comforts of the good life, the adventure of squatting nevertheless threatens to tear them apart, especially as they begin to unearth the mysteries surrounding the homeowner's death. Those are three log lines. They're all similar, they're all the same. One, they, they begin to tell more and more story. Now, what I like to do is I have an idea for a film, right? As you can see, this idea is similar to the film Parasite, which I absolutely adore. I thought it was brilliant. Much better than this year's winner, if you ask me. But anyway, Parasite was a brilliant film. And my film, even though I wrote the first draft, Long before Parasite, I mean, filmmaking people, you know how crazy it is, right? My, my producer, my original producer was arrested three days before filming. It was originally called Beverly Hills Barrier. He was arrested in Los Angeles, went to jail, killed himself in jail. Four years later, I said, you know what? I'm going to make this film in Miami and retitle it and rewrite it. And now it's on HBO. That's not unusual for the film business. It's full of curveballs. And if you, if you are rigid in anything, you're going to get broken. It's, this is a job for, if, if you're a great generalist, you have a future in this business. You have to be good at a lot of things to do this well. You know, those people who can be chemistry majors and physicists, they don't do this that well, generally speaking. So I begin by creating a pitch, which is not different than the synopsis itself. The synopsis is, is literally well-written, I hope, right? Has sentences, it's, it's polished. But the pitch is a verbal version of the synopsis. And what I'm doing, again, is I'm testing my story. I'll pitch it to other writers. I'll tell you a story. When I graduated from UCLA Film School, uh, like the previous guy, was, the previous uh, writing teacher was saying, I had one of my best friends was a guy named Michael Miner. And Michael knocked on my door one day because we used to trade screenplays. He says, Tom, you want to read this uh, synopsis I wrote? Sure, Michael. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll have coffee. Great. So I read it. It's three pages long. And it's about a, co a futuristic cop and has a lot of the genre tropes of cops and sci-fi and all this. And at that point in time, I was a little probably too much like he described, and, you know, more intellectual, more crazy, doing really weird, you know, trying to break the pattern, the molds of filmmaking because I was 27 years old. That's what you do. You're trying to reinvent the wheel. He was saying, don't reinvent the wheel. I think when you're 27, try and reinvent the wheel because when you're my age, you're not going to have the ability to even think about that too often. Once in a while, you can kiss it and run. But anyway, so I read this two and a half page synopsis. And he says, Tom, what do you think? And I said, well, Michael, if you want to do something like that, go ahead and do it. I said, what's the title? He said, RoboCop. Now, RoboCop became a billion dollar franchise that young Tom Muska was dismissing as commercial claptrap. It happened to me again. When did this happen? Well, 
there was a gentleman named Neil Moritz who saw my student film and invited me up to see his father. Now his father was a, worked for something called UIP, which was more like the drive-in type films. And he had a poster there called Mulholland Drive and had a car and a bunch of kids. No, not the David Lynch film, but a car and a bunch of kids. And he said, I heard you're a good writer. I want to hire you to write this film. Well, what's the story? I don't have one. It's just look at the poster. You see it? OK. But young Tom Muska had just gotten into the writer. I saw my first film, which is called Little Nikita. And I'd just gotten into the Writers Guild, which identity is a gigantic thing in this business, who you are, what you think of yourself, how you promote yourself. So I wasn't willing to work under Writers Guild minimum and jeopardize my newly found place in the Writers Guild because for that, identity was everything to me. That became the Fast and Furious franchise, um, which probably dwarfed Robocop by a lot. Um, Neil Moritz is still making those films. That's okay. One of the most important f words in screenwriting and film business is what? Four letters. What is it? No, it's not the one that starts with F. What is the most, what is the most important word you think in screenwriting? Or in our business? Yeah. Job? Job? That's three letters. Jump. What? What? Jump. Oh, jump. What does that mean? That means take the chance. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. That, that, I like that. Take a chance. Yeah. You're right. Go for it. Take a chance. Get your out. Don't be afraid to embarrass yourself. I have done some ridiculous things. I waited once an hour and a half in a men's room for an executive to come out of his office so I could, could confront him. It worked. Anyway, um, and nothing really untoward happened, trust me. OK. Um, next is the word I'm looking for, N-E-X-T. Next is a really important word. You're going to, when, we t when uh, Edwin James Owens and I took uh, Stan and the Liver around, we went to Disney. And the guy at Disney looked at us and said, you know, I like this film. I think I could get my son to see it, and he'd like it but I don't think he could get his friend to see it. And Edward and I looked at each other and said, okay, thank you. <laughs> we stood up and walked out of the room. There was nothing left to say. That's what his opinion was. He's a marketing person. He may not have been totally wrong or totally right, but it was next. You're gonna have people who's not gonna understand what you're doing. Not that, it's, not that what you do is that good. I have no idea until I look at it, nor does anyone else. Most of the stuff I look at isn't that good. I'm not going to pretend it is. I read 50 screenplays at the end of every semester. Am I supposed to act like they're all good? Of course they're not. They're, we're looking in the, for a first draft. Is there something there? So what's, what's, what are we really doing here? What can we do with this? How can the screenplay evolve into something good? And the first thing is, does the story work? It's almost like I think of a story as a pail of water, okay? If a story, if a pail of water has a hole in it, I don't care how pretty it looks, it doesn't work as a pail, does it? It's gonna leak all over your shoes before you get from here to there. Now, if a pail works, doesn't mean it's good. If a story works, doesn't mean it's good. It means at least it has a beginning, middle, and end, and it somewhat achieves what it went out to achieve. It satisfies its own premise. But it doesn't mean it's good. Good stuff is rare. It is rare. So anyway, we talked about a scene. Each scene, this is a good quote, each scene tries to solve a problem for the protagonist, but fails. But in doing so, it complicates the plot. The word therefore. It's not, these things happen. The bad screenwriter, young screenwriters, they'll pitch me ideas and they'll go, and blah, 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 blah. And blah, 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 blah. And blah, 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 blah. No. You got to say blah, 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 blah. Therefore, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, blah, blah, blah. That's structure. Too many of you write scenes that have only one thing happening in them. Those are the scenes that get left on the cutting room floor. You have to have multiple subplots threaded through your scenes. Let's look at themes. Plot is what happens, theme is what it's about, right? This gentleman who directed this, David Frankel, lives in Miami. He wrote, he didn't write this, he directed uh, 
Devil Wears Prada. What would you sacrifice to be excellent? That's what that film is about, in five words. Every scene is pregnated with that idea. What would you sacrifice to be excellent? Citizen Kane. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose the innocence of childhood? Citizen Kane. Let's jump. When Harry met Sally, can friendship and love be compatible? My film. Now, we, I, I thought this was the theme, so I put it on the poster as a tagline. So if you look at my poster, and they'll have a tagline. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Now, when you get to your writing, don't state what it's about. Prove what it's about. You have to learn how to dramatize ideas. That's something a lot of people don't understand. The, the characters t tell things. The characters give up information way too easily in most young people screenplays. It's not earned by the protagonist bending over backwards to get this. It's given to them. This is uh, Michael Miner, RoboCop. He and I, remember, we heard this and we looked at each other and said, that's it. In nine words, screenwriting. Make them laugh, make them cry, but make them wait. You, if you don't like to manipulate people, don't do this. Look at, look at, look at the Godfather poster, right? It's all like manipulation. We manipulate the viewer. That's our job. We're not their friend. We manipulate, we know what they're thinking, and then we do a reveal and a reverse and let them anticipate something, and then we throw a curveball at their head. Why are so many stories about criminals and the underbelly of society? Because you want extreme things, the worst things to happen all the time. How come so many professors not the good screenwriting professors, by the way, but how so many professors are from Harvard in movies. Ever notice that? Like every other professor is from Harvard. Another thing is let the film happen in the audience. And that's just as simple as knowing what scenes to write and knowing what scenes to omit. And your first go through, you're going to go fat and long and redundant, that's fine. But what most good screenwriters do is they immediately start editing themselves and playing with it. Most amateur screenwriters think everything they do is brilliant. They're so happy. They can't wait to read it to their girlfriend or whatever. Oh, wow, isn't this great? No, it's not. Think about this. What are some of the great cuts in film structure? What are some of the, whoop, there it is. Go down, go away, go away. I showed it, but if you didn't see it, tell me. What, what is one of the great cuts of, in, in film history? Hey, he got it. Now, think about this. 2001, right? The apes, the weak apes get the bone. They show up back at the water hole. The strong apes are there, right? They're ignorant, they're, they're powerful, they're confident. The weak apes figure out that bone is a weapon. Boom! You're dead. Screw you. I win. And he takes that bone, remember? And remember how his face, it's so human. He goes, and he throws it. And we watch it. Now, we could have cut to what? I wrote some of these down. We could have gone to Greece and Rome. We could have gone the invention of the wheel. We could have done gunpowder, cut to the plague, Shakespeare. Enlightenment steam engine, the light bulb, Charlie Chaplin, World War II. We could have gone to a number of human history milestones, but we go all the way to 2001 in the spaceship, and the audience fills it all in, don't they? And that's, a fil that's the film happening in the audience. When your writing is doing that, when you're aware of what an audience will write for you, what you can take out, there's so much more room to write what you need. You're always fighting time and space. Most screenwriters, now Sorkin was mentioned, Sorkin overwrites terribly and he'll admit it. But dialogue does play, he is very good dialogue, dialogue does play a little quicker and he can get away with it now because he's Aaron Sorkin. Oliver Stone I knew, you know what he used to do? 
Sometimes he hired uh, this one project. He hired two sets of writers, didn't tell them. Two sets of writers on this one project. And so then the scripts come in, and Oliver took both scripts and said, thanks, guys, and then rewrote them into his screenplay. <laughs> Shit happens. Um, I can talk about true stories. He mentioned briefly earlier about the difference between truth versus fact, which is a big deal. But it's like dialogue. You're not trying to write actual the way we converse with each other. It's, dialogue is like a, a, a painting in real life is like a photograph. It is a much more nuanced, controlled emphasis of what you're trying to do in the scene. And most of you overwrite. Now, I once had, I, I, in all my work with actors, most of them get insane when you cut their lines. They don't like it. What do you mean? You cut my scene? I love that scene. You cut these lines? I liked it. I like saying that. Okay. I had one actor, though, who did the exact opposite. He said, Mazga, what? Mazga, what? Cut some of my lines. I can't act. It's, it's overwritten. I can't act. I can't do anything with this. It's too, too many words. That was Benicio del Toro. He wanted me to bring his down so he had room to move within the moment. You could feel, you could act. You have to be aware of what the actor and director can bring to a moment. Character. You can argue that the purpose of drama is to demonstrate how people take action that is outside the realm of their personality. I watched, I rewatched The Godfather the other day. One and two, back to back. Michael Corleone starts as a war hero. He becomes a godfather far more deadly than his own father ever was. It's all about character change. What does a character want? Seems like a very simple question. Character is expressed through action and it's overcoming obstacle. You must make sure you have enough obstacles. You know, put, put, put your character up a tree, throw rocks at it, and get them down again. That's the three act structure. All right, I'm going to jump all this. This is all wonderful stuff. But I think, I think you've heard two screenwriting teachers back to back, and I'd rather answer some questions you have. Um, let me see if there's anything else. I love this. Love interest, sex is Cleveland, romance is Paris. Okay? There's a reason the door closes in a lot of films and the lights go black and we cut away from sex. It's really not that interesting. Why? Because these people aren't in conflict. They've decided to consummate their relationship. Where's the conflict? There isn't any. There's nothing to watch. It's how they have sex. Okay. That's pornography. All right. Description. Be concise. Seduce the reader. These are, I stole these from some of my uh, students. Because I, what, what? Too much detail. When you overwrite your description, the reader actually stops participating. He's like, you're, you're setting, so you're, you're painting a, let me give you an example of that. I love, the, some, you know, I'll read it. This, uh, 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 I was reading a student script and he was describing a law office. A lot of stuff, you know, becomes legal in screenplays. And he was talking about the mahogany furniture and the, the, the ladders that, that roll left and right and the bookcases and the window and the light. And the, and the creaky floor and the rug. And I said, you know, you just spent, I just spent, you know, 20 minutes reading this, what this scene looks like from the point of view of the production designer. What, what am I watching? He said, well, I wanted to know that it's a wealthy, it's a very, you know, big time law office. So I said, why don't you just write this? A law office that charges $800 an hour. Boom, run. That's all you need to do. You're not the production designer, you're the screenwriter. Write with active, not passive words. Jay Storms have action, movement. What are the things about a film that we like? It's kinetic, it moves. The hardest thing about film is internal conflict. 
Brilliantly done and on the waterfront, though. Those of you who want to see a great example of why Marlon Brando is always often said to be the best actor, go watch On the Waterfront and go watch an internal conflict within an actor. You'll see it. It's not voiceover. It's Brando playing his emotions. We talked about this. We talked about this. This is another thing. Dare to be loud and forceful. How many times a semester I tell my students, hang a lantern on it. You have a major inflection point in your screenplay. Show me it is. Don't bury it in a paragraph. Give it some room, air. Make sure I know that this is where the screenplay goes this way. This is an important point. Make sure you show it. Don't just include it. Emphasize it in your screenplay. Finding your style. Style is not easily imposed. It's who you are as an artist. You don't find your style, it finds you. This is, this is a, a, an interesting thing for young writers to read. Because we were, I think when I was a young, I was a bit of a show off. Your screenwriting, writing style is not a way to show off. It's probably just the opposite. It's your sincerity. Trust the material. Trust the material. Write less, think more. It's one of the things I learned. I used to start writing way too early. I never wrote the synopsis. I never did that. I started right on scene. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. Look at this. I got 10 pages, 15, 20, 25, 30 pages. Whoa, look at this. I don't do that. I contemplate my journey with my character, who they are, what it could possibly be. And then write something that shows me that you know something what a camera can do. Stage your scenes. Have an have a implication of staging, how they're going to be photographed without using the words close up or wide shot or any of that. It's it's an emphasis. It's you're a conductor. Conduct your screenplay. So it's easy to read. Make it easy to read. All right, I think I'm about there. Uh, Hollywood doesn't need another Tarantino or Wes Anderson. They already have those. They want the first you. Write a screenplay that no one but yourself can write, and then it might have a shot. Don't jump on someone else's bandwagon. It's not going to work. You're already three years too late of, of all of those. By the time your screenplay gets made, <laughs> that idea is old hat. All right, that's enough, right? Here's a, just so to show you. Here's a. Uh, here, this is what I write. This is synopsis. I wrote. I got a job off of this at HBO. So it's only what? Look, two. Ooh, look at this. It's only a, you know a page and a half. But it's it's the essence of the movie. It auditioning for a movie. It eventually did become a screenplay. All right? Preguntas, por favor. Anybody got questions? Yes. Is it bad to kind of strive for making your scenes at least three minutes long? Like, since you already got a location, the actors, the wardrobe you're, change. You're thinking backwards. I know. You never think, how long should the scene be? Write the scene. Let the scene tell you how long it should be. I never say, this is a six-minute scene. Here I go. Yeah, no, I, I know I, I know what you mean. I, I, wrote, I was shooting a... A feature film last year, and the main the main actress. It was a, a story in a three year period of a lifetime of a person. And while I was shooting it, I realized that the the main actress had fifty wardrobe changes. Right, so we 50? were fifty. So we were shooting Big budget film. No, so we were shooting like I was trying to shoot seven minutes a day, but because of the wardrobe changes and the makeup and the jewelry, it was a little hectic. Because it's like we're shooting three minutes and she got to go into wardrobe changes for a minute scene and, and this and that. So I said, 
oh, maybe I should just make scenes longer and just like have the conversations kind of like blending into into a scene. Why don't you make her poor so she doesn't have money to buy all the other clothes? <laughs> and then we know why she's wearing the same dress in every scene. I don't know. I know. There's always a solution to the problem. It's just not always the most obvious one. Was that? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yes, sir. How have you dealt when you hit a point where most people call writer's block? Never. Where, oh, you never had that? Unfortunately. I, I, I wish I did. I, yeah, just keep I'm going always capable of, of, of drivel. All right. I'm a good guest at a dinner party. I'll just talk shit. <laughs> I really don't have, to, I've never had writer's block in my life. I don't understand it. I know, I know it exists. I mean, did you I struggle with a scene like you were like, it wasn't coming together the way you wanted yeah. You had to go back and redo it multiple it's, times it's, to get I, to I tried to say that earlier in the lecture. It's about story structures, the dentist chair, the worst possible day of screenwriting. Like once I figure out my story, I'll do my synopsis. I'll, I'll put muscle to the bone and write a treatment. Sometimes I'll go 20 or 30 pages, all prose. And then I'll go to a scene list and identify the actual scene components. And then I execute. Basically, it takes me, at that point, 10 days, 10 pages a day, I got a screenplay. Now I read it. And I find there's a structural problem. That is not fun. Then I have to sometimes go back to prose to solve the structural problem. I don't try to solve it in a screenplay form. Because the screenplay form is an MF. It's a motherfucker. It is not fun to manipulate. It will, it, will, it will hypnotize you like nothing else. So I go back to concept. I try to reroute it through bottom up. And then attack it. And I, I'm doing it constantly. I just wrote a screenplay. We were shooting in uh, Puerto Rico. There. And uh, yeah, I thought my third act turned into my second half of my second act. Thank you. I'm curious because you brought up Nomad Land, and um, I know it's hard to write like a, a a journey that's a mostly internal journey for a character. And um, I'm wondering, is there is there a way you would have been able to rewrite some of Why that to I'm make it <laughs> rewrite some of that film to make it less boring? I mean, it was. <laughs> I I don't mean like. Francis McDormand is great, and it was beautifully shot, but I was... It's, look, it's, I, I'm it's wondering if there's a way very, to make that work. Yeah, I wish he had a relationship with David Strathairn that went somewhere, somehow, even if he killed her, or she killed him, or they ran over her, his dog, or something happened. Besides, I'm not sure I want to live at this house anymore. I, you know, I found it a little bit... The stake's pretty low. You know, raising the stakes is one of the things you've heard us say. It's just a way of... Doesn't mean it has to be a Hollywood film. When you, <clears throat> two things, Tom. Hey, first of all, great to see you again. I was happy to see you on the list. Thrilled, actually. Um, uh, your synopsis. Yeah. The the most important things in the synopsis. Read it here. It's I'll, I'll, you know I'll show you. Too. What if Jackie Robinson didn't play along with what he saw and instead rebelled and recoiled? It's, it's again, it's, it's encompassing the entire story, but really it's an emphasis on character over plot. Okay. That's right. what's important. And then it when is you, not the plot of the film. Okay. It's character over plot. Then when you get to your saying you're writing the prose. What? Yeah. Then when you say, you, you know, because you say synopsis. Yeah, prose. Treat, so the, this, yeah. This no, no. When, in the, when you said you write like 20 to 30 pages oh, of yeah. prose. What is included? What is that? The entire oh, story? Then I start, then I'm into story more so, but not as much as when I actually do scene, uh, scene breakdown. That's the story and scenes. I mean, it's a hybrid form. It's halfway between the synopsis and the script. So I'm, I'm, I'm pushing towards it. Like, like a, a piece of dialogue will occur to me and I'll, I'll put it in. But I'm not constructing the screenplay yet. I'm right. moving in its direction now. So synopsis is just kind of like a, it's, it's, a, it's a pitch. See? Like, okay. It's, it's, it's like, is there, you know, the first question is, is there a movie there? Is there a what? A movie there. Yeah, got it. Not all ideas are movies. Right. right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. 
Can you talk a little bit about your process from selling the script to HBO? I didn't sell a script to HBO. I sold a, uh, uh, well, I had in the past. This, in fact, this one. This one I was brought in to rewrite somebody they had hired that didn't work. So, I, I said, so they said, write a synopsis. And this is what I did. I wrote the synopsis and then I got the rewrite because they didn't like what was there. Uh, but, no, but what I do with that one, uh, the last Chateau Vato, which you can see on HBO, it's uh, HBO Max. It's in it's it's English with a lot of Latino characters. Anyway, uh, it, it premiered at the uh, Miami Film Festival. Uh, I know somebody. They I invited them to see it. They saw it and said, "We want this." And then you get on the phone. You talk money. That's how it works. I mean, you know, you have to bring it to the eyes of someone who can buy it. Now, that's what film festivals can do. And I have a pedigree of some, some sort, so if I say something, you know, oh, well, let, let's see what the old guy's doing. You know? It's a good to be young in this business, by the way. Hi. Um, I have a, I, when I'm writing, I often have a, uh, a dilemma of whether or not I should just let the dialogue end a scene, or like if something happens, if, if I should describe how a character is, is crushed in some action or anything, do you do you describe how characters feel? Okay, he's, it's a good question. Yeah, yes, I more and more actually, my writing evolves more and more in that direction. That uh, I'm, I'm I'm writing the reaction shots in more and more. You know, he's you know usually a, a, usually a, a, a scene ends on a piece of dialogue, and then maybe it goes to the person who just lost the scene, and we see them go. Right? So I'll say, he contemplates that moment, not sure that he had made the right decision. So you're, I'm actually describing a shot. Yeah, it's fine to do that. But more and more, for some reason, now I am uh, distrusting directors, even if I'm the director. And I'm writing, in, I'm, I'm writing in the psychological reality of the piece, much and more so. Which is replete in my synopsis to begin with. The, the synopsis has a lot of psychological reality. But it doesn't have plot. Plot is the hard work. I have one other question. Um, if some, I got advice one time that said, um, it's kind of over oversimplification, but it said that you should never have a scene with two people who agree with each other. Yeah, that's pretty true. Unless, unless the, only, the only probably exception is if it's comedic. But then it's probably not comedic. <laughs> no, that's that, someone brought it up. You know, conflict, conflict, conflict. Conflict is the essence of drama. Even if it's subtext. Even if I'm saying, hey, you, you know, let's say I want this water, and you're there and I'm here, and I say, you can have it. The subtext may be, I actually want it, but I'm pretending not to want it, so you'll give it to me because I know you're a really nice guy. That's the psychological dimensions of a movie, of a scene. But what you, you have to do as you mature as a screenwriter is look at the whole thing. Don't get stuck in, in your little moments that, you know, there's something in Hollywood they call killing your babies, which means sometimes throwing away shit you, you think is working and you like, because it, it really, a good example would be the, the Wizard of Oz. If you ever, if you want to have fun, Google Ray Bolger's uh, solo dance. It is incredible to watch the uh, scarecrow dance for three minutes. It's like, fuck, it's great. But they cut a lot of it out because it hurt the whole film. Woody Allen once said, I take away some of my best lines because it makes my other lines that much better. <laughs> the speeding of the, the momentum. You know, you, you watch, if you ever see a film, I tell my students, don't sit in the second row of your film when you're showing it. Sit in the last row and ride the audience. You'll see everyone go like this at a point. Is that it? All right, good luck in the web fest. <laughs>